The next thing we're going to look at is measures of spread. This is really important for statisticians. Um, I, so the measures of spread are seeing how spread out our data is. So if we have data that say we're looking at these heights here, if somebody's really, really, really short, and then there are individuals that are really tall, then that's going to have a high spread. Um, if all everyone's close to the same height, it's going to be a low spread. So the higher the number on the things that I'm about to show you, that means your data is more spread out, and the lower numbers is they're going to be they're going to be closer together. But in a nutshell, that's what this is. So this is something that I use constantly. Um, you'll there percentiles and quartiles. So the difference between that, if you know what a percentile is. Quartile is just a name for the 25th, the 50th, and the 75th percentiles. So a percentile is, say we choose one data point. In this case, I gave the example pretending we have heights here for these individuals. So we're seeing here um, 58 is the 25th quartile, meaning that 25% of the data in your data set is below this value. So the median, we've already gone over, it's the center value. So in this case, it would be 60. Um, and then if we look at this 64, excuse me, we, we see that 75% because it's the 75th percentile or the 75th quartile, 75% um, of the data is below this 64. So that's what a quartile is. The reason we use this, and you're gonna see more about it, um, when you're first putting data into your computer, um, you uh, want to see what your data looks like. So I'm going to show you how to run a summary, but you want to see what the minimum is, which is the lowest value. You want to see what that 25th percentile is and going all the way up to the maximum, because then that gives you an idea of how big and small your values are and how spread apart they are. Um, that's just the bird's eye view. Um, does that make sense? Quartiles make sense to everybody. So one measure of spread that we use is called the interquartile range. So that's simply the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. That's all it is. Um, this, we learn this because it helps us identify outliers. So we use this value to identify outliers, which I'm gonna, gonna show, but that's all the interquartile ranges, 75th percentile, your value minus the 25th percentile. And you'll see this down here. 64 minus 58 is six. So for these heights, the IQR or interquartile, interquartile range is those two values. So I just said, this is how it helps us identify outliers. Outliers are a big reason why we look at these descriptive statistics at all. So outliers are data that's way far away from the rest of your data. So for instance, if your mean is say 30 and you have an outlier that's 120, and then the rest of your data is really packed around that 30 value, then that's considered an outlier. And outliers are a problem, and we'll learn more about having to deal with those because when you put them in to statistical tests, even descriptive statistics like mean, and another one I'm gonna show you, standard deviation, that one outlier will draw the mean way far out away from the rest of your data because outliers have a huge impact on the mean value. Go ahead. So with outliers, is there like a, like a way to determine whether it's an outlier that should be disregarded from your analysis? Yeah. Or whether it's in a reasonable range of including in your analysis? This is why we learned the IQR and why I'm showing you this. So. We, if you go back here, I couldn't fit it on the slide, but this, pretend this is our data right here, these people. So our interquartile range, we already have it, the 75th minus the 25th is six. So we then have here, um, so this is our interquartile range. You multiply that by 1.5 every time. Um, so you then take, this is, and I should have labeled this a little better. So you'll see up here our, <clears throat> 25th percentile is 58. And then to get the lowest level that, if it's lower than this, it's an outlier. You take that 25th percentile number, 
and subtract your interquartile range times 1.5. So you can see the actual formula down here. And this is one you actually need to know how to run and what it means. So you have your 25th percentile minus 1.5 times the interquartile range. Now that identifies low outliers. We're going to identify that upper outliers. Um, we would look at the 75th percentile and then add that 1.5 times the interquartile range. 1.5 is a fixed number? Yes, it's a fixed number that never changes. There are a lot of other ways to identify outliers, but this is the most commonly used and it's the most simple. When you get higher up, and for your use case, it might you might be better to do another way, but this is how you do it. And dealing with outliers is a whole topic in itself because sometimes you want to keep them in, sometimes you want to take them out. It just depends on the situation. As we go through all of our statistical tests, I'll explain, okay, if we have outliers here, what should we do? Um, but this will identify. And when we have here, so I, I, this upper... Uh, uh, IQR is showing to be 73. This 75 value, since it's greater than 73, this is an outlier. Go ahead. Um, let's say that you have those outliers. Right? But before you do anything with the data, you do the changing part, right? Yes. So can we eliminate those outliers and the changing? So that's what I was just saying. It's going to depend on your use case, whether you get rid of them, whether you keep them in. Um, I can try to give an example that happened in real life. So I, as I was saying, do doing predictions for that, for our seed production process. So an example where it was, I got rid of outliers. Um, so I looked at each individual location. So we plant all around the world to see how the corn grows in different environments. So I, one way that I looked at outliers, if I saw that the whole, I'd say 90% of one location was considered an outlier, and I did use this in quartile, interquartile range number to identify them, if 90% of my data in one location is an outlier, that was probably has a lot more to do with the environment than the seed, because we probably had a drought, or we had so much rain that it got inundated. So we assumed that if all of those values were mostly bad, then we took out those outliers because we wanted to see how the seed performed. We didn't care about droughts or extreme weather conditions because nothing is going to do well in extreme weather conditions. So that's a one time when I kept them, I took them out. Another time when I kept them in is for a project I the outliers were meaningful in some way. I can't remember the exact project that I was working on, but they thought that, say, outliers from a certain region, so say one region of our data was really far out, but learning about those really far out values in that certain region, I think it was India, it used to be because the climate's so much different than, say, in South America and the United States. They were usually outliers, but we needed to keep those in because we wanted to learn about India. It had to do with the actual seeds in in we wanted we gained information from keeping those in. So those are two examples where you would definitely want to take them out based on your use case, and then when you would want to keep them in because it added information. And you knowing your data, you have to make that decision. Um, and I'm going to help you try to go through different problems and say, okay, if I have this situation, what should I do? And we'll actually go through examples. And I think that that will help you, but hopefully that makes sense. So it's going to depend on your use case. So this is another way. It's a visual way to look at outliers. So I am, I have a code to create this exact box plot um, in your code and we'll run it in a second. But you'll see here, um, they call it a box, box, box and whisker plot as well. Um, that's another thing that you would call it. But box plots show you the distribution of your data, what exactly what I just taught you. So everything 25, 75% uh, and above is gonna be in this tail. This is my 75th percentile. This is my median. This is my 25th percentile. All these are below the 25th percentile, and that is an outlier. 
So if you want to get all that information, instead of running individual statistics, you could also look at this box plot and see it visually. So that's another way to look at it. Um, any questions before I have you run this code? I believe that's next. Okay, yeah, I am gonna go through one more. This is an example, I gave you the formula, but I don't want you to worry about that too much because I have count, the only time I have calculated the standard deviation myself was in statistics classes. I've never done it my, by hand in my job. So I put it there just so in case it's for extra information, but just understand the concept. That's what's important. So measure, as I said, the measures of spread tell you how far apart your data is. The standard deviation is one we use a lot. So the standard deviation measures that spread and the higher your standard deviation value, the more spread out it is. The lower it is, the less spread out it is. So this is an example. So I tried to um, pick two, this is an example that you would wanna keep in mind. So I pulled out the world adult literacy percent and the world employment percent. They're both percentages. So you couldn't really compare, like if one that I was gonna do was the number of personal computers owned by 100 people in each country on average. But you can't really compare the standard deviation of that value to a percent because they're gonna look very different. Um, so in this case, I chose two percentage numbers just so we could compare them. So you'll see here, um, that, and this is the summary statistic that I told you about, that will print out the min, first quartile or the minimum, first quartile, median, the mean, the third quartile, and the max. I'm gonna tell you more about what's, the, the mean and median difference tells you something. I'm gonna go over that a little bit later. But this standard deviation, so if we're looking down here, this data is, looks to be closer together than this data. See, we're seeing um, the 75% of the data is above uh, 75 here. We're seeing that this 51 number, um, so it's a lot lower. Um, so this data is a lot more close together and it's spread out in the same. So we have about the same amount here above the me median and we have the same amount here below the median about. So you'll see over here, that's the opposite thing. So we're seeing that almost all the data is above 75. Um, so we're seeing, but we're seeing really small outliers here. So my lowest value is as low as this one, but the first quartile is 75. So we, what that tells you is there are a lot of outliers in this data. So there are a whole bunch of really, really small values. And then most of the values the most of the values are high, but there's a couple really small ones. Over here, we're seeing it spread out pretty evenly. And I'm gonna show you how to see that in a graph as well. But you'll see that this, since it's spread out pretty evenly, we have a standard deviation of 10.5. You're seeing a higher number over here, which is 17.5 because of those outliers. Um, and you have to run both of these to understand why the standard deviation would be different because that's how you would approach it. You would run the summary and say, okay, hey, how do these relate to each other? Any questions about that? Go ahead. Standard deviation is the deviation of each. It's it, looking at the how spread out your data is. And if you want to look back, and I'm trying not to inundate you with formulas, this is how you actually calculate it. But that's not going to make sense to a lot of you. And I've never done it by hand. You just need to know that the higher it is, the more spread out it is, the lower it is, the closer they are together. Can I answer this question? Mm -hmm. So you find the median, but let's say you have five elements, and you see each element, how far is it from the median? In this case, A would be element distance between uh, element one and B, uh, the median, and that gap is A. The next element would be a little far away, that gap is B. Okay. What could be this side of the gap is C. So you find the whole spread is from the median, between mm -hmm. all of them, and you square them, and then you just square them, and then you average them, and you just square them. Yeah. But what we're seeing here in practicality, another way to look at this is the range. So see, our highest value is 99 here, and our lowest is 33. So if you subtract 33 from 99, 66. So you see here, it's 83 and 32. So our range is smaller. 
So that also explains why that number is smaller. So um, this is very important. So outliers affect those measures that I just showed you, some of them, and they don't affect others. So the mean and the standard deviation are impacted greatly by outliers. So if you have a couple small values, it's going to move your standard deviation or your mean towards those outliers by a lot. It's going to make a huge difference. So that's why you want to look at your data and find those outliers, because if you have them, these numbers, um, there's a thing called representativeness. So this mean value, if you have two huge outliers, it's not going to be representative of your data. So basically, it's not going to represent the bulk of your data, which is why outliers are a problem. So if I want to learn something about the central point of my values and it's getting pulled way farther in the other direction by two values, that's not going to tell me that very much information about, say, there's another 90 values. Those 90 values that are close together, we want to learn about them, not the two outliers. So that's something you have to keep in mind. If you want something to be representative of your, your data, if you actually want to learn something, outliers can be an issue. So the mean and the standard deviation are highly affected by outliers. On the other hand, median and IQR, or interquartile range, those are not affected at all. So if you know your data has many outliers and you want to learn about the center, use the median. If you know that your data doesn't have outliers, you should use the mean. So that's an example of when you would want to look at your data and see which one would be best for your use case. You always want to keep that in mind. And that's something that you'll see over and over and over and over again with statistical tests, with everything that you have to keep in mind how your outliers are impacting your data. Because if we're running a prediction model on seeds, we don't want to learn about those two values. We want to learn about the other 80. So keep that in mind when you're running your data. Does anybody have any questions about that? It's a very, very important concept. Okay. So now we're going to go in and see this in action. So if we go back to R. I have the exercise numbers. This one will be number two and number three we're going to run. So we have that same uh, data. So we have that world, that data frame data. Um, the top is men and the bottom is women. So I'm going to run that IQR for, for men first. And we're going to compare the standard deviation as well. So the first one that you run, 5.5, is the IQR or interquartile range for men. And then the second one will be the standard deviation. So... Then to compare that to women, we have that seven value. So you're seeing basically from what we saw before, this shouldn't be surprising, um, that women are more spread out than men on both measures. So basically there are probably several countries that are really low that don't have really low uh, education for women that are skewing the data in that direction. So whereas industrialized countries are probably way over here. Um, and there are a few that are way over here. So whereas men, they seem to be more even and lumped together, which when we look at what we know about the world, that makes sense. Um, the next thing I wanted to do is show you what this looked like with a, a box plot. The annoying thing about ggplot is you have to have the data in a certain format to run it, which is why I had you run two files with the same information. So this schooling uh, data here has the same information in it that the world data frame is. So if you want to look at what your data looks like, you can press this right here. So the world data frame, I have a lot of stuff in here, uh, so you guys can play around with it. Um, one thing about this data set, there's a lot of missing values, so just keep that in mind. So you'll see that the mean years of schooling for uh, men, it has its own variable. Um, and then you're seeing the women value here. So it has the, its own variable or column for women and men. In order to run a graph once it finally opens, um, we have to have it all in two columns or variables. 
So you'll see when this opens that the first variable has whether it's women or whether it's men. And then the second variable here has that mean year of schooling. So we have women up here. If you scroll down, way down, we have men down here. So now they're in two columns um, and they're labeled. So all of the values are here. Um, I'll, I can talk more about that if you take the R programming class, but I wanted to explain and show you what the data looked like as well. So we're just gonna run this box plot here. And when you do it, you might wanna make this screen bigger because then you can see a lot better. I think part of my screen's getting cut off. Um, so we wanna... So take a minute and like type in a note or something and tell me what you think this means. Based on what you've learned, um, take a look at this, run this code on your computer and tell me what information do I gain from looking at this? And remember that these will have our 25th percentile, our median, our 75th percentile um, on both values. Look back at the notes, try to write down what you think this, these box plots tell you. And I'll stop and give you some time. Back to this, um, if a brave volunteer wants to let me know what they came up for this explanation, um, I would like, I can explain it, but it's better if you guys explain it. Cross my fingers. Not, I will. So any volunteers explaining what the box plots tell us? Okay, so up here, as I said, is the 25th percentile. We have our, the, uh, uh, anything above that, sorry, I misspoke. So anything up here is above the 75th percentile. This is our 75th percentile. Um, this is our median. This is our 25th percentile. And it, this is below the 25th percentile. We're not seeing any outliers here when we split it out by male and female. Um, so we're seeing here that this data is in our, our standard deviation and IQR told us exactly this, that the data has a hot, larger range. So the tail, this is what we would call the tail, is farther down for women here. So we're seeing lower values more often here than we're seeing here which is what we would expect given our global environment. So, and then these values are closer together. So men who their education level is more often at a higher level and they say they're closer together. So men as a whole, the whole way through the population have higher education. Um, whereas women, it's more spread out. A lot of women have higher education. A lot of them are here, but more of them are down here too. So that's how you would look at this and say, okay, what does this tell me? When you're making data visualizations, um, whether it's in Excel or anything, you want to have this, if you're making PowerPoint presentations, the so what is important. And you want to not inundate people. You want that to tell a story. That's the big thing with data visualization and anything that you if you're presenting statistics to an audience, know your audience is number one. If they don't have a statistics background, they don't wanna know how you calculated your t-test. They don't care. They don't know what that is. They don't, they wanna know that you ran a model and the results, how does that affect them? How does that change their behavior? If you have a statistic, a group of data scientists or statisticians, you look at that completely differently. So yeah, you would show this and you could use terms and jargon that only data scientists would know. So that is, you have to know who's in the room and change your language based on who's in the room. So that's one thing, my point of advice, because I've failed on that a lot. Um, but that's what this tells you. Um, it tells you about your data distribution. That's what you run a box plot. Data shapes. This is important as well. Go ahead. The outliers, this data, when we split it by male and female, there are no outliers or they would be a dot. So in this particular data set, there are nothing that is above that, that 
cutoff or below that cutoff that we saw, which is the IQR times 1.5 and we're adding it to the top and subtracting it from the bottom. So nothing was past that threshold in that particular data set. So, and then since it's grouped, it would calculate those values by group. Keep that in mind. So that IQR would have been calculated for men and for women separately. So that's good to keep in mind. Any other questions about that? Is there ever a time when you would want to calculate the IQR of the combined data? Yes. So I, in that case, I would have done both. So if I was doing a data a project with that data set, I having the most information is usually helpful. So I would, if I was running my analysis by group, absolutely, I would want to do it by group. And I'd also want to know about the bigger data set, but the group would be the more, I would give you more information. So 